we are holding our own. These five words were the last of Captain Ernest McSorley, as the ship under his command soon thereafter slipped beneath the waves of Lake Superior on November 10, 1975. Thousands of wrecks line the bottom of the Great Lakes, but none more infamous than the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. At 729 feet long, a beam of 75 and a depth of 39, the Fitz would be the largest Laker built at the time of her construction in 1958. These dimensions were the maximum for a ship looking to use the locks of the St. Lawrence River to reach the Atlantic. However, the pride of the American side served a single mission, to shuttle taconite from the iron mines of Minnesota's Arrowhead to the steel mills that lined the eastern Great Lakes. Over the years, it carried out its mission handily, continuously breaking load records over its career. In 17 years, though never seeing the Atlantic, the ship had completed 748 round trips from the mines to the mills. However, trip 749 would prove to be ill-fated. The morning of November 9th, 1975 found the Edmund Fitzgerald in Superior, Wisconsin. Conditions were mild that morning with overcast and a slight five knot southeasterly breeze. 800 miles to the southwest, a trough in the upper atmosphere is beginning to eject northeast. This caused a surface low to develop over the southern high plains which continued to deepen as it tracked northeast. Fitzgerald departs from port in the early afternoon, fully loaded with over 26,000 tons of taconite bound for Detroit. Simultaneously, the National Weather Service is eyeing the track of the strengthening surface low. They forecast it to directly come over Lake Superior the following day, meaning winds and waves will be problematic for Lakers traversing the body of water. They issue a gale warning for Lake Superior. Departing from Two Harbors, Minnesota, the fellow ore boat SS Arthur M. Anderson, captained by Jesse Bernie Cooper, gains a visual on the Fitzgerald. The two ships would closely screen each other for the voyage across Superior as conditions slowly began to deteriorate. They mutually elect to head for the northern Canadian shoreline which should shelter them from tomorrow's waves. At 7pm local time, the surface low had deepened to 993 millibars, spawning a localized tornado outbreak over eastern Iowa. Into the night, winds and rain out of the northeast continued to increase, with the 1am weather report from the Fitzgerald recording 52 knot winds and 10 foot waves. Reports like this and from other vessels prompted the NWS to upgrade their gale warning to a storm warning. As dawn broke, both the Anderson and Fitzgerald crossed from American to Canadian waters. The low was now centered over Michigan's upper peninsula at an impressive 982 millibars. At midday, the two vessels would enjoy a brief moment of calm, the low passed directly over them and the real danger loomed. The backside of the low brought with it even stronger winds out of the northwest. Unlike being ahead of the low, they were now behind the cold front, where a brisk air mass plowed in. What was once rain is now a thick snowfall, drastically dropping visibility. As they threaded the gap between Michipicodon and Caribou Islands, Captain McSorley radioed Captain Cooper of the Anderson. Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. I have sustained some topside damage. I have a fence reeled down, two vents lost or damaged, and a list. I'm checking down. Will you stay by me till I get to Whitefish? Charlie on that, Fitzgerald. Anderson could only watch the Fitzgerald through its surface radar, registering as a blip nine miles off their bow at 3.30 p.m. News only got worse 30 minutes later. Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. I have lost both radars. Can you provide me with radar plots till we reach Whitefish Bay? Charlie on that, Fitzgerald. We'll keep you advised of position. For the next hour, McSorley's situation grows increasingly dire on the Fitz. Ahead of the two Lakers is the Avafors, a Swedish ore carrier bound for the Atlantic. McSorley asks for any vessel to confirm the status of Whitefish Point Lighthouse and Radio Beacon as they are essentially blind. Avafors confirms the light but is unable to dial into the beacon. The following radio exchange between the two ships paints a bleak picture. 
The wind is really howling down here. What are the conditions where you are? Don't let nobody on deck. What's that, Fitzgerald? Unclear. Over. I have a bad list, lost both radars, and I'm taking on heavy seas over the deck. One of the worst seas I've ever been in. If I'm correct, you have two radars. They're both gone. Back on the Anderson, winds ripped at a sustained 65 miles per hour with hurricane force gusts over 80. Near 7 p.m., Captain Cooper braces for two massive 35-foot rogue waves approaching off of the starboard quarter. Water floods the deck of the Anderson and smashes into the back of the pilot house, partially damaging the vessel. Nevertheless, the ship weathered the impact. First mate Morgan Clark then radios the Fitzgerald to check on their condition. Fitzgerald, this is Anderson. Have you checked down? Yes, we have. How are you making out with your problem? We are holding our own. Okay, fine. I'll be talking to you later. Except the Anderson would not talk to McSorley later. Five minutes after that exchange, the Fitzgerald enters a squall, obscuring it from the Anderson's radar. It never re-emerges, and a break in the precipitation reveals no lights coming from where the ship should be, prompting the Anderson to radio the Coast Guard. Once reaching the safety of Whitefish Bay, the Coast Guard, with no assets in the immediate area, asks for them to do the impossible. Venture back into Greater Lake Superior to search for survivors. The Anderson and fellow bulk carrier SS William Clay Ford bravely headed back out into the storm in an attempt to locate the 29 missing sailors. They would be unsuccessful, finding only bits of small debris. It would take a full three days for a U.S. Naval sub-hunting aircraft to detect the presence of the Edmund Fitzgerald's wreck. A Navy submersible officially confirmed the identity of the doomed Laker. The first and last 250 feet of the ship remained largely intact, with the bow still upright and the stern keeled over. Ships like the Anderson, the same type of vessel as the Fitz, weathered the storm with relatively minor damage. What led to the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald seemed to be a compound of issues. Investigations into the sinking were conducted by the U.S. Coast Guard and the National Transportation Safety Board. After over a year of scouring over evidence, the Coast Guard published their report without a conclusive root cause. However, the most likely cause in their estimation was a flooding of the cargo hold via ineffective hatch closures as waves flooded the deck. Taconite is a dense cargo, so even at max load, the ship had plenty of empty space in the cargo hold. Hatch covers were damaged or missing over many of the openings when surveying the wreck, including some with signs of external buckling load. Water ingress over time in the hold would have easily caused the list that doomed the ship in the peak of the storm. The NTSB would soon after come to a similar likely scenario. The Lake Carriers Association fought these conclusions back hard. Captain Cooper went on the record, providing a much different explanation as to what doomed Edmund Fitzgerald. Shortly before McSorley radioed the Anderson the first signs of trouble, Cooper commented on the bridge that the Fitzgerald was much too close to Six Fathom Shoal for his comfort. This shoal, located just north of Caribou Island, lies only 11 feet below the waves. Had the vessel bottomed out amidships, and that could have easily caused railings to snap in tension and compromised the hull. The Canadian Coast Guard resurveyed the area in 1976, discovering a mile east of Six Fathom that was previously uncharted and lied directly in the path of the Fitzgerald's final course. All of this only further cemented Captain Cooper's belief that the Fitzgerald was already beginning to sink when McSorley first radioed of the ship's issues at 3.30 p.m. There was no way in his mind that a leaky hatch or vent covers could have caused the list so quickly. The downed railing also pointed to another major possibility similar to the grounding. The Edmund Fitzgerald could have suffered a catastrophic structural hull failure due to fatigue stress. Fatigue stress is the weakening of a material over time that had been subjected to repeated loads. Given that the Fitz was the first Seaway Max vessel for the St. Lawrence River, its proportions made it a rather lanky vessel, especially if it were to sail in the ocean. Former crew of the Fitzgerald stated that it would flex like a diving board in rough conditions. Over time, the welded joints of the hull to the keel could have fatigued from repeated bending wave after wave, and the storm of November 1975 or even a slight contact with the shoal was the straw that broke the camel's back. 
This theory gained steam a few years after the sinking, when the Fitzgerald's sister ship, the SS Arthur B. Homer, was scrapped just months after an extensive overhaul by the shipbuilder. When the NTSB asked to check out the vessel, the shipbuilder denied permission. These actions raised questions that maybe the welded hulls of the sister ships were inferior to their riveted counterparts. Ultimately though, the NTSB's rebuttal for both the grounding and structural failures was that there was no indication on the visible areas of the hull of either event taking place. However, to further refute, the critical central part of the hull that would have seen the greatest bending moment load was the most damaged part of the ship in the sinking, making it nearly impossible to confirm. The final moments of the Fitzgerald were likely quick and similar in nature. The lack of distress signal meant that the Fitz likely took a large wave from the starboard quarter that completely submerged the forward bridge. This was then followed by subsequent waves that further drove the ship into the surf, likely buckling the cargo hatches inward as seen on the wreck, fully flooding the forward holds. Whether already compromised or not, the hull would not be able to bear the brunt of all the water forward of the stern, snapping the mighty bulk carrier in two. The quick nature of the ship's demise led many to point to the two massive rogue waves that Captain Cooper had experienced on the Anderson shortly before the loss of the Fitzgerald. They did travel in the general direction of McSorley's ship, and the further fetch could have grown them into even greater waves that an already battered Fitzgerald would not have been able to survive. Across all of the theories, the weather was undoubtedly a major component. Thirty years after the sinking, National Weather Service meteorologists used modern computer modeling to create a simulation of that storm in November of 1975. Key results of this research noted that the northwestern winds were not only amplified by vertical mixing, but also the terrain of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This, coupled with the extremely long fetch of the waves to compound and grow, meant that the Fitzgerald steamed into the most intense waves and winds on all of Lake Superior at the worst possible time. It was found that the frequency of a storm of this caliber on Lake Superior wasn't super rare, with a return period of roughly two years. What separated it from other storms, however, was the waves traveled from west to east rather than the typical north to south. In all of the records available, no storm ever on Lake Superior had waves of over 20 feet that traveled west to east. This makes one of the last comments of Captain Ernest McSorley, a 44-year veteran of sailing the Great Lakes, unequivocally true. He had never seen a sea as bad as November the 10th, 1975. While the debate of what doomed the Edmund Fitzgerald still persists, its sinking prompted a number of recommendations that ultimately made the Great Lakes shipping fleet a safer one. Fitzgerald remains the largest vessel ever lost in the Great Lakes, and her legacy is one of great speculation, but yet it is forever immortalized in the 1976 ballad The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot, dedicated to the 29 souls that went down with her on that infamous night in November. Mm -hmm.